Well, good morning, church. My name is Glenn Norman. I have the privilege of being the lead pastor of this congregation. I've been thinking this week a lot about transitions um, and remembering some transitions that I've made in my life. One of the major ones, of course, was when I made a decision to follow Jesus Christ. I was 20 years old at the time and just came to a point in my life where I realized I don't know what my life is for. I don't know what my purpose is. I feel kind of lost and directionless and empty. There must be something more than this to life. And I thought, well, what people in the past have done when they have these sort of questions is they've studied philosophy. So I went to the library and got a book out on philosophy and I started reading the introduction and the introduction said, this book is not going to give you any answers, it's just going to give you different ways of thinking about questions. So I closed the book and returned it to the library because that is no good to me at all. Um, I wanted answers and I, I played table tennis with a guy called John who invited me to church and it was there in church as the pastor was preaching through the Sermon on the Mount that I started getting some of the answers that I was looking for. And so I remember the day when I decided to follow Jesus Christ and it's one of these moments in your life where you feel like it's a big moment. Um, my heart was beating faster. I could feel that I was like feeling stressed because something was about to happen and I prayed a prayer of commitment to Jesus Christ and started to follow him. But it wasn't until about a year later that I got baptized. I don't know if I wasn't listening carefully or just got confused, but I, I thought that I needed to wait until I was really serious about Christianity before I got baptized. Whereas if I'd have paid more attention to the New Testament, I would have seen that the pattern is believe and be baptized. It happened almost instantaneously for people in the New Testament. During that year, there was definitely a sense of rearrangement. There was a sense of getting things in order. It, when you become a Christian, it's a little bit like moving to a different country. Have any of you ever lived for a period of time in another country? Okay, oh, quite a lot of you, that's good. Um, so I had this experience when, um, when I was 27, I moved and lived in Germany for almost four years. And Germany is very different. I realized one of the big differences between countries is what you do with your French fries um, or chips as we call them in England, pommes, as they call them in Germany. Now, in England, what you put on French fries is vinegar because it tastes great. And if you haven't tried it, you don't know what you're missing. Um, in Germany, what they put on French fries or pommes is mayonnaise, which is delicious, unhealthy, but delicious. And in America, what you put on French fries is massive amounts of ketchup or sometimes even chili, which I find very, very strange. But that's just one of the minor differences, but there's a, there's a lot of differences. And I remember when I was in Germany, at a certain point, you have to register as a foreigner and you have to go to some place called the Auslanderbehörderungsamt, which in itself is a test because if you can't say it, you can't register. Um, so I had, the Germans, they tend to put lots of words together instead of saying the place where you register, it's the, the registering place where foreigners have to go, all one word. So I went there and we got registered. When, when it comes to America, there was a, a transition moment when I got my green card. So I was allowed to work here in perpetuity. But did you know that you could lose your green card if you leave the States for a period of time and you don't tell them? Like you can go away for six months to say, I'm on a project, I'm working in England with the government, don't tell anybody, and I'll be back. Um, but if you leave for like three years, you, you are accused of what's called abandonment. And basically, the American government takes this position that we gave you this great privilege of living in these United States, and you abandoned us, so you're done now. And then you have to go through the whole application again. Well, I did eventually get my citizenship, which means that I am an American. Um, and it felt like another transitional moment when I finally got my American passport. So now I have multiple, pass uh, just two passports, um, and I can use whichever one is most useful for the country that I'm going into, and it's the fast lane. For me, when I actually got baptized, that felt like a real marker moment in my life. It was a transitional moment. As I said, through this year, before I got baptized, there was a lot of sorting out to be done. There was a lot of realizing, oh, I, I don't do that anymore. I can't behave that way anymore. That's not fitting for a Christian to do. And some stuff had to die away and some new habits had to form. And, and it was really sometimes a bit chaotic this, this year of struggle. But I remember the, the day that I got baptized, I remember it very well, in Northwood Road, Tankerton Evangelical Church, and I was baptized. I just remember that week following baptism, I was filled with the most incredible sense of peace. 
and it was almost like the struggle was over. Now, of course, I still struggle with sin. If you don't believe me, ask anyone who knows me. Um, it, it's still sometimes very difficult to live the Christian life, but this sense, this sense of inner chaos and the battle raging was sort of done. And I just felt this settled peace in my life, like a peace I've never experienced before, that I belonged to Jesus and I'd marked that fact and now it was settled. Today we're going to be talking about baptism and we may be having baptisms in the service, that really depends upon you. Um, We'll come to that later. So we're in a series called Change Your Story, Change Your Life, and we're going to look at a great story of baptism which happens in the book of Acts. This is a book in the New Testament which really details the history of the church. Just after Jesus uh, died on the cross, was resurrected and ascended into heaven, the early church, the beginnings of the church started. What happened there is recorded in the book of Acts. And the church is starting to share the gospel. And... Jesus said, you will share the gospel in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And so that's happening. It's been to Jerusalem. It's in Judea, moving its way to Samaria, and it's on its way. There are some real lessons to be learned from this story about the responsiveness of both of the main characters. If you have a Bible with you, turn to Acts chapter 8, and I'll be reading from verses 26 to 40. Um, You can also follow it on the screen behind me. Acts 8, 26 to 40. Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, go south to the road, the desert road, that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. So he started out, and on his way he met an Ethiopian eunuch, an important official in charge of all the treasury of the Kandake, which means queen of the Ethiopians. This man had gone to Jerusalem to worship, and on his way home was sitting in his chariot, reading the book of Isaiah the prophet. The spirit told Philip, go to that chariot and stay near it. Then Philip ran up to the chariot and heard the man reading Isaiah the prophet. Do you understand what you are reading? Philip asked. How can I, he said, unless someone explains it to me. So he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. This is the passage of scripture the eunuch was reading. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter, and as a lamb before its shearer is silent, so he did not open his mouth. In his humiliation, he was deprived of justice. Who can speak of his descendants, for his life was taken from the earth? The eunuch asked Philip, Tell me, please, who is the prophet talking about, himself or someone else? Then Philip began with that very passage of scripture and told him the good news about Jesus. As they traveled along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, Look, here is water. What can stand in the way of my being baptized? And he gave orders to stop the chariot. Then both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. When they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord suddenly took Philip away, and the eunuch did not see him again, but went on his way rejoicing. Philip, however, appeared at Azotus and traveled about, preaching the gospel in all the towns until he reached Caesarea. So this is a fascinating story, and you've probably never heard the word eunuch used so many times in such short succession as in that story. The commentators are actually divided on the question as to whether this man actually was a eunuch or whether that was just a slang term for a government official. And I can't resolve that, so for most of this message, I'm just going to refer to him as the Ethiopian. Um, In this story, I want us to consider the question, who is at your gate? And that will make sense in a moment. A couple of chapters later in the book of Acts, the conversion of Cornelius, a Roman soldier, happens. And it's noted as the first Gentile conversion, the first non-Jewish conversion. So that means that this Ethiopian is not a Gentile, which leads us to assume that he's either already a Jewish proselyte, which means someone who has converted to Judaism, or he is what is known as a near proselyte, someone who's interested in Judaism, but hasn't yet committed to it. The Jews at the time had a lovely phrase for someone who was a near proselyte. They call them a person who was at the gate. It's a person who was on the very brink of coming in, but hadn't done so yet. And in this story, we see that the Ethiopian is at the gate of Christianity. He already has familiarity with the Old Testament, which was the only scriptures the Jews knew at that time. He's interested in worshiping God because he's just been to the temple in Jerusalem where he intended to worship. So we know that in many ways, God had already prepared him for this encounter. God was already at work in this man's life 
and he was at the gate of Christianity. When we think about people we know, people we encounter in our lives who have not yet made a commitment to Christianity, there may be some who truly are at the gate. Maybe they've started reading the Bible. Maybe they've had conversations with a few Christians and God has already been at work in their heart preparing them. I know for myself and probably for you too, you sometimes worry about how do I bring up the subject of Christianity with my coworkers or with my friends? Like they know I'm a Christian, I know that I'm supposed to share the gospel with them, but where do I start? And we fear this because we think we're starting at zero. But because God is already at work in their life, they may be much further ahead than we know. And so our role at this point may not be introducing them to the basics of Christianity, but helping them understand what God is already doing in their life. Who is at your gate? Which of your neighbors is curious about where you go every Sunday morning? Which work colleague of yours has been feeling an emptiness of soul and wonders who they could talk to about this? Who at your school is reading a book of philosophy and finding it unhelpful and reading about other religions, wondering where to find real truth? Which parent sitting near you in the bleachers as you watch your kid's game is at the gate? Who is the person who is at the very brink of coming in? Who is the person who is asking whether there is more to life? Who is at your gate? Are you looking for them? The next thing I want to talk about is your role as a decoder. For sure, sometimes people are lacking a basic understanding of Christianity or the gospel of Jesus Christ, and that can be our starting point. But at other times, they may already suspect that God is at work in their life. And our role is to act more like a decoder to help them identify the fingerprints of God, the ways in which he might be speaking to them, the ways in which he might be intersecting with their life and calling them to faith in him. And this encounter between Philip and the Ethiopian actually provides a good framework or template for how to do this. First, we see that Philip starts where the Ethiopian is. He responds to what we might say is the felt need of the Ethiopian. The Ethiopian is having difficulty understanding the scripture that he's reading and so Philip asks a question and that in itself is an interesting approach to ask a question we might think when we consider those around us who are not Christians that we know what they need to hear and we so we lay down our gospel presentation but that might not actually scratch where they are itching we may think that what people need to know is truth We might think that they need to have a knowledge of the supreme God or they'll be interested in knowing how to deal with the guilt that they feel about their sin, but that might not be at all where they are coming from. We never want to be those type of Christians who say, Jesus is the answer, now what's the question? If we went to the doctor and we sat in the doctor's office and he came in and said hello, late as always, I don't know why they're always late, um, but came in, And why are you all sitting on paper as well? Is that weird to anyone else that you're sitting on paper? Anyway, leaving that aside. But if the doctor just came in and sat down and started writing out the prescription and then said, there you go, wouldn't you be a bit suspicious of that doctor? He said, well, I haven't even told you what's wrong with me and you're already writing the prescription. You know, we may genuinely believe that Jesus is the answer to most of the problems that people face. But if we don't ask questions, we can just come across as a salesperson wanting to make a presentation rather than a friend interested in where they are truly at. Until we get into conversation with someone, we don't really know what particular problem Jesus might be able to address in their life. It's only when we spend time and find out where they're at, where they become genuinely convinced that we care about them, that these type of conversations can happen. And the pattern we see in this story is that Philip starts exactly where the Ethiopian is at. The Ethiopian is having trouble understanding the scriptures, and that's where Philip offers to help. One of my friends has a great question he asks people when he thinks they may be interested in God. He says, if God could do one thing in your life, and you're not allowed to mention the lottery, what would that thing be? He just gets that one out of the way, because people always say that, win the lottery. Um, what would you ask God to do for you? And then if they seem receptive, he says, would you mind if I prayed that, that thing, 
that very thing for you right now. Would you mind if I prayed that if God is real, he would do that in your life? And if he does, would you start paying attention? And often people are like, sure, go ahead. And he gets the opportunity to pray for that thing. But he starts with a question. Another question I've asked people, which can sometimes get an interesting response, is has there ever been a time in your life when you sensed God? Because you don't know where you're starting from. Someone might say, you know what, I really felt close to God until I was about eight years old when this thing happened and since that point, and then you say, okay, now I've got a different understanding of how to approach this discussion. I've noticed recently, I don't get many telemarketing calls on my cell phone because I have a spam filter on my cell phone called Truecaller, which eliminates most of them, but I've noticed that spam callers are getting pretty clever. Because there was one recently I got, and the person said hello, and I said hello, and then there was a noise, and they said, oh, sorry, I just dropped my headset, and I said, oh, that's fine, I'll wait. And then they picked it up, and then, and then I st they started talking. I said, hold on a second, and they kept on talking. The whole thing was a scam. There was no one dropping their headset and picking it up and putting it on again, but it made me sympathetic to their plight, and I was like, oh, really? What, what's it going? You know, it's, uh, it's sneaky. Um, when you try to interrupt, nothing happens. The voice just continues on with the sales pitch. And I wonder if Christians ever come across like that. If we come across as though we have this prepackaged presentation of the gospel, one size fits all, and we're not that interested what the person's individual circumstance is like. I think Philip in this story gives a great example of being interested in exactly what this person is struggling with. The third question I want to ask this morning is, are you ready to respond? This story actually has some great elements of responsiveness. In the first place, an angel of the Lord or the spirit of the Lord, these phrases are used interchangeably, often in Acts, uh, communicates to Philip saying, rise and go toward the south to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. Philip could quite legitimately have some questions about this. Why do you want me to go and stand by the road in the middle of the desert? But he doesn't. It simply says, and he rose and went. So this story begins with a divine command that is met with immediate human responsiveness. Philip manages to explain the gospel to the Ethiopian, starting with the passage of scripture that he's reading, and he does such a good job that the Ethiopian realizes that he should get baptized. Now, it's an interesting question as to whether that was part of the presentation of Philip or being a near proselyte this Ethiopian knew that when someone converts to Judaism, they get baptized, and he assumed that the same thing would be true if you convert to Christianity. Personally, I think it was probably part of Philip's explanation of what it meant to follow Christ. But whatever Philip said, something about it made the Ethiopian realize that baptism was both a necessary and an urgent step to take. So let's look at that for a moment. Why is baptism necessary? Well, there are a few obvious reasons. Jesus commanded it. When he gave the commission to the church to take the gospel to the ends of the earth, at the end of Matthew chapter 28, he said, go into all the world, preach the good news to all peoples, baptizing them and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. So Jesus commanded his church that when someone makes a decision to follow Jesus Christ, you should baptize them. Secondly, Jesus modeled this himself. Theoretically, Jesus might not have needed to be baptized because baptism symbolizes the washing away of our sins and Jesus had no sins to be washed away, being the sinless son of God. But he did it both as an act of obedience and to model it for us, which leads me to the position, if it's good enough for Jesus, then it's good enough for me. If Jesus felt that he needed to do it, who am I to think that I don't? One of the key things, though, is that the beginning of the Christian life is characterized by a sense of surrender and submission and obedience. We surrender the right to live our life our way. And sometimes that's not an easy surrender. It's not like, oh, I give up. It's more like, Urgh. I mean, I remember this process for myself that I thought what Jesus wanted was my Sunday mornings. And then I realized that I'd miscalculate it because what he wanted was everything, every part of my life. And I wasn't sure that I wanted to give all of it up but but we understand we we surrender our right to live our life our way and we choose to live our life God's way we submit to his will rather than following our own will we choose to live a life of obedience rather than a life of rebellion 
And the very act of baptism is the living out of that mentality. Allowing yourself to be dipped under the water is in a way an act of submission and surrender. And because Jesus commanded it, it's also an act of obedience. So the very act of choosing to be baptized represents this mentality that will serve us well for the whole of our Christian life. The mentality of surrender, submission, and obedience. In the early church, back in the first century, in fact, for the first couple of centuries after the church was founded, when someone was about to be baptized, they would ask a question of the congregation. They would say to the whole church, what hinders this person from being baptized? And it was like a rhetorical question, and the expected answer was, of course, nothing. It's like in a traditional wedding when the pastor would ask, if anyone knows of any lawful reason or impediment why these two should not be married, let him speak now or forever hold his peace. And you really hope no one speaks. I did a wedding once. I did a wedding once where the bride says, please don't ask that question. And it's not part of the usual wedding ceremony that I do. But she said, please don't ask that question. And I said, why not? She said, because if you do, there are going to be people on my side of the family that stand up and object. So don't ask the question. I was like, fair enough, won't ask the question. <laughs> so the clear implication when you say, what hinders this person from being baptized and the church says nothing, the clear implication is that this thing should happen unless there are really compelling reasons why it shouldn't. So when I'm discussing baptism with a person who has made a decision to follow Jesus Christ, but who has not yet been baptized, my essential question is, why wouldn't you be baptized? Why wouldn't you take this step of surrender and submission and obedience? And if a person hesitates on this point, I honestly wonder if they are still holding out on Jesus in some area. If they cannot obey even this simple command, how deep really is their desire to follow Jesus and be obedient to him? The way I imagine it, I was thinking about this just yesterday, it, it would be as if I were doing a wedding and the couple do the I do's, do you take this man to be your wedded husband? The couple do the I do's and they say their vows to each other and then I go into my spiel. As a sign and symbol of these promises you are making today, you have decided to exchange rings. May I have the rings please? Um, and then... Stefan, would you place the ring on Julia's finger? And he says, I'm not doing that. I said, sorry? No, I don't want to do that. I said, well, why? I just, I just don't want to wear a ring. And I, at this point, it's never happened. Pray God that it never will. But, but at this point, I would be concerned. I would be wondering, why does this person not want to display their public commitment to this other person? Are they embarrassed? Are they not fully committed? Is there something I don't know? Is there another woman? You know, I, I don't know what's going on, but that makes me worry. If someone is not prepared to make a public commitment and say, I identify with this person, then I wanna know why are you holding back here? Why is baptism urgent? In this story, we see that the Ethiopian not only considers it necessary, but it also feels urgent to him. At the very first opportunity he has, he wants to be baptized. So why is getting baptized urgent? I think what he understood is that baptism isn't just about getting immersed in water. You can do that when you have a bath. But there's a deeper meaning to it. Baptism is a mark and a ritual of identification. When we are baptized, we are baptized into Christ's death and resurrection. The lowering of the body into water represents Christ going down into death. The raising up of the body from the water represents Christ being raised in resurrection power from the dead. So we often say these words when we baptize someone in this church, you are buried with Christ, but raised up to new life in him. When we get baptized, we are choosing to publicly identify with Christ and his people. Two Monday nights ago in England, there was a terrorist attack in Manchester. There was another terrorist attack yesterday, my poor country. Um, but this terrorist attack in Manchester, England happened after an Ariana Grande concert and 22 people died. The country was in shock that another terrorist attack had happened. On the following day, that Tuesday, I wore my Manchester United shirt all day. And on that day, for me, it wasn't about the fact that I happened to support Manchester United Football Club. It was that I wanted to express my identification and sorrow with the people of Manchester. My wearing of that shirt on that day was an act of identification. 
When we choose to get baptized, we're acknowledging a death and a resurrection and an identification with God's people. And baptism in this way is a transition marker. There was a before and now there is an after. And in baptism, this transition is marked and symbolized. It becomes a memorable moment. And in this story, we see the incredible responsiveness of both Philip and the Ethiopian. When God commands something, they obey. We see that the Ethiopian recognized that once he had decided to follow Jesus Christ, baptism was both necessary and urgent. So this is my challenge to you today. Where do you need to be responsive to the commands of God? Perhaps for you, it is in making a decision to follow Jesus for the very first time. Perhaps you've never taken that step and you realize, you know, I've been around church for a bit. Um, I've been on the periphery. And honestly, you know enough. You know the gospel well enough to decide whether you want to follow Jesus, but you're holding back. Maybe today is a day when you decide, I'm not holding back anymore. I am going for this. And your heart might be beating faster and you think, oh, this feels like a big deal. And it is a big deal. You are moving from death to life, the Bible says. It's a huge deal. If you've decided to follow Jesus Christ, but have not yet taken the step of baptism, then that's a clear and obvious area. You could decide to do that even today. We are equipped to baptize anybody who decides in this service that they want to get baptized. Out the back, we have changing rooms. We have T-shirts with I have decided. Very nice T-shirts. Um, we have shorts. We have towels. We have hair dryers. We have hair gel. It's like a spa back there. Um, <laughs> we have all you need if you decide that you want to get baptized today. And you might be thinking, well, I didn't bring stuff with me. I didn't bring a towel. We have all that stuff. Do you know why? So that you don't have any excuses. Um, so maybe you realize that you do need to get baptized, but you want your family, your friends, and your neighbors to be here and witness it. And that's going to take a couple of weeks to organize. So maybe that's something you decide to do, but it's going to happen in a couple of weeks. So today is not your best day. But for some of you, it might be. So I want to encourage you now to spend a moment in prayer and ask God if this is a step of obedience that you need to take today. If it is, as the band comes up after I finish speaking, um, during the next song, then make your way through that door on my left, your right, and there's a team of people back there who'll just have a brief conversation with you, and we will get you set up for baptism. After a couple of songs, if anyone has chosen to be baptized today, then the screen will raise up here and we will perform baptisms. Um, if not, we'll just keep on singing and pretend I never talked about this at all. Um, I honestly don't want this to be any sort of pressure thing except the internal pressure that the Holy Spirit might be whispering to your heart. And, and if the Holy Spirit is saying, you need to take that step today, then you listen to the Holy Spirit and walk through that door and we'll get you set up. I want to make it clear that this sacrament of baptism is for those who have decided to follow Jesus Christ. If you're not at that place yet, then simply watch today and continue on your journey. You may be at the gate today, but I pray that you walk through it soon. Let's pray together. God, I just want to allow a moment here for you to speak into people's hearts, to, to move them, to take this step of obedience, if that's what you desire for them. So Lord, I'm just going to pause and ask you to speak to any hearts that need to hear that this morning. Lord God, we thank you for this beautiful example of the Ethiopian and of Philip, that when you say, go do this, they go and do it. It's just simple, straightforward obedience. And Lord, we recognize that to be baptized is, is just that, a simple, straightforward step of obedience. So Lord, I pray for any who are wavering in that this morning, that you will uh, just take their hand, take them over the line and bring them to this place of submission and obedience to you. In Jesus' name, amen.